Hello. In this week's Torah portion, Vayigash, Joseph is finally about to reveal his identity to his brothers after 21 years. Quote, Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, have everyone withdraw from me. So there was no one else about when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. Joseph's sobs were so loud that the Egyptians could hear, and so the news reached Pharaoh's palace. A little earlier, when Joseph saw his brothers again for the first time, we are told, quote, he turned away from them and wept. This was especially true when he reunited with his younger brother, Benjamin, his only full brother. Quote, Joseph was overcome with feeling toward his brother Benjamin and was on the verge of tears. He went into a room and wept there. A little later, after Joseph revealed himself, we read, quote, With that, Joseph embraced his brother Benjamin around the neck and wept. And Benjamin also wept on his neck. Joseph kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. Only then were his brothers able to talk to him. And Joseph went to Goshen to meet his father Israel, that is Jacob. He pre presented himself to him, embraced him around the neck, and wept on his neck a good while. Later, when his father Jacob dies, quote, Joseph flung himself upon his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And Joseph was in tears as his brothers spoke to him. That's a lot of crying on the part of Joseph and everyone concerned. Indeed, crying is a very common occurrence in the Torah and in the rest of the Tanakh and the Talmud. An electronic search shows hundreds of occurrences. Western society tends to associate crying with women, not men, but not so in ancient Jewish history. We read about men shedding tears of joy, tears of anger, tears of sadness, tears of frustration, tears of pain, tears of supplication. No one felt they had to be a man and not show their emotions in public. <clears throat> There are tears of joy, such as when Jacob meets Rachel and falls in love with her at first sight. Quote, then Jacob kissed Rachel and broke into tears. And he had just met her. There are tears of anger, such as when Esau discovers that his brother Jacob, pretending to be him, gets their father's blessing. Quote, Esau burst into wild and bitter sobbing and said to his father, bless me too, father. There are tears of sadness, such as when King David loses a son. Quote, and King David wept and said, Oh, my son of Shalom, my son, my son of Shalom. Would that I had died instead of you, O of Shalom, my son, my son. When the Jews are carried off into exile after the destruction of the first temple, they pass by Rachel's grave, and the prophet Jeremiah quotes God as saying, a cry is heard in Ramah, wailing and bitter weeping. Rachel weeps for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children, for they are gone. There are tears of frustration, such as when Israelites were unhappy about the restricted diet in the desert. Quote, the Israelites wept and said, if only we had need to eat. There are tears of supplication. The Talmud teaches that crying during prayer breaks all barriers. Quote, the gates of tears are not locked, and one who cries before God may rest assured that his prayers will be answered. As it is stated in the book of Psalms, hear my prayer, Lord, and give ear to my pleading. Do not be silent at my tears. The Zohar repeats this teaching. Those who oversee the ways of prayer break down all locks and bars and bring in these tears. That person's prayer is then admitted before God, the Holy King. Rav Nachman of Breslov, mincing no words, thought, quote, You should cry out to God, scream and cry out to him over and over again, like a woman in labor who cries out from the pain of her contractions. 
you must do likewise and cry out to God again and again until he takes pity on you and helps you to strengthen yourself. Simha Bunim, a 19th century mystic, asked a pertinent question. If the gates of tears are always open, why are they there at all? And he answers, only tears that are authentic and heartfelt are accepted in heaven. Fakers will find the gates of tears shut in their face. Crocodile tears need not apply. An example is the meeting between Esau and Jacob, long estranged brothers. Quote, Esau ran to greet Jacob, he kissed him, and they wept. Many doubt Esau's tears were sincere, considering how much he hated his brother. Entire communities cry when they hear bad news, such as when the Israelites hear the negative report of the spies who scouted the promised land. Quote, the whole community broke into loud cries and the people wept that night. Even God's cries. After the fall of the first temple, the prophet Jeremiah quotes God as saying, quote, my soul shall weep in secret because of your greatness curtailed. My eye must stream and flow with copious tears because my flock is taken captive. The Talmud adds, Rabbi Lazar said, why these three references to God's tears in this verse? One is for the first temple, the other two refer to the future. One is for the second temple, and one is for the diaspora, the exile of the Jewish people. Where does God cry? The Talmud says it's in a place called Mistarim, because the verse says, my soul shall weep in secret, and in secret is Bemistarim in Hebrew, which can also be read in Mistarim. Is it seemly that God should cry? The Midrash says that God cries in secret, as the verse from Jeremiah implies. Once the temple was burned, the Holy One, blessed be he, wept and said, Woe is me for what I have done. I arrested my divine presence below for the sake of Israel. Now I have returned to my original place. I have become a laughing stock to the nations and a mockery to the people. At that moment, the angel Metatron came and fell on his face and said before God, Master of the universe, I will weep, but you will not weep. God said to him, If you do not allow me to weep, now I will enter a place into which you have no permission to enter, Mistarim, and there I will weep. Mistarim is therefore God's innermost abode, his private quarters, as it were. There he weeps alone. Another instance, God is very sad when we don't study Torah, as we are supposed to. The Talmud says, quote, the Holy One, blessed be He, cries every day for one who is able to engage in Torah study and does not do it. Now, what does modern science say? Many scientific studies have been conducted on the phenomenon of crying, and they all conclude that it provides many benefits. First, tears clean, lubricate, nourish, and protect the eyes. Second, Crying provides welcome relief from pent-up emotions, even catharsis. Third, people who cry are seen as sadder, friendlier, and less aggressive than people who don't. This leads to the fact that more people are willing to help them. Seeing people cry makes us feel closer to them. So to conclude, crying, bechi in Hebrew, is good. Keeping our feelings bottled up is bad for our health physical and mental. Real men do cry. Real Jews do cry. We must never be ashamed of our tears. They represent our humanity. So let them flow and remember what the psalmist says. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. This is the message for today. If you didn't like it, feel free to cry. Shabbat Shalom.